If you are having multiple small pellet-sized bowel movements that leave you pretty unsatisfied in the bathroom, you could have potholes in your colon. I'm Dr. Robin Chutkan, gastroenterologist, microbiome expert, and author, and I am here to help you find gut bliss. On today's episode of the Gut Bliss Podcast, Barbara is a 57-year-old judge who came to see me about her bowel habits. Having a bowel movement had become a full-time job for Barbara. She would have a smallish log after her morning coffee, but then things would completely deteriorate after that with multiple pellet-sized bowel movements. And every time she moved her bowels, she could feel that she still had more stool inside, but she couldn't get it to come out. And after each bowel movement, within an hour or two, she was back in the bathroom for another try. Barbara was experiencing something called tenesmus, which is a medical term for a feeling of incomplete evacuation that can occur when your colon is not emptying completely. As a result, she was feeling very full and very sluggish. She did not want to go out to dinner. She did not want to go to the gym. She did not want to be intimate with her husband. She wanted to get the stool out of her colon and into the toilet. Barbara told me that one of the things she was really embarrassed about and struggling with was keeping her underwear clean. She was having problems with leakage as well as what she called wet gas. And she had to wear a panty liner and sometimes even a pad to absorb the leakage and the occasional stray pellets that would find their way into her underwear. She was also going through mounds of toilet paper from endless wiping after each bowel movement. Things had been fine in the bathroom for Barbara until about three years ago. She had had her first screening colonoscopy seven years ago when she turned 50, so that's a little late because we actually recommend age 45. But she'd been told by the gastroenterologist who did the colonoscopy that everything was normal. Now, she wasn't having any symptoms at the time seven years ago. When she went to see her primary care doctor more recently with these symptoms, he told her that she likely had irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, and actually recommended that she consider stepping down from her position as a federally appointed judge to do something less, quote unquote, stressful. Real advice that he gave her. But Barbara wasn't stressed out by her work as a federal judge. She was stressed out by her bowel movements. So I asked Barbara to bring in all her old records for me to review, including the colonoscopy report from seven years ago. And I want to just stress to you how important this is to review the records yourself, even if you are not a physician. I do a lot of second opinion consultations and sometimes third and fourth opinion consultations. And I cannot tell you how often somebody will say, yes, I had that test and the doctor said it was normal. And then when I actually get the result of the test, the CAT scan or the ultrasound or the colonoscopy and review it myself, I see that it was not normal. So get a copy of the report and read it. It may have a lot of medical speak, But what you want to pay attention to is the impression at the bottom of the report where the person, the professional who is doing the test, gives their interpretation of what's going on. Barbara's colonoscopy report from seven years ago described a narrowed sigmoid colon due to bowel wall thickening and a few scattered, shallow orifices in the lower part of her colon. Classic early diverticulosis otherwise known as potholes in the colon. The Gut Bliss Podcast is brought to you by VizBiome, my first and quite frankly, my only choice for a probiotic. Whether you're dealing with irritable bowel syndrome or just looking to restore your gut health, VizBiome can help. It's a medical food for the dietary management of IBS and gut inflammation. Backed by science and clinically vetted by thousands of my own patients. Find your gut bliss with VizBiome. Go to visbiome.com backslash gut bliss and use discount code gut bliss at checkout. Almost half of the population over age 50 in the U.S. has diverticulosis. And since that is close to the age when we recommend doing a colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer at 45, 
it's not surprising that it's one of the commonest things we see on colonoscopy, often as an incidental finding in someone who's asymptomatic, as it was for Barbara during her colonoscopy seven years ago. The good news is that diverticulosis is not a risk factor for colon cancer, and it usually doesn't require any medical intervention the way other conditions like polyps or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's might. But the not-so-good news is that for this same reason, it tends to get overlooked as an inconsequential finding. And it may not even get mentioned to someone who's asymptomatic, as again was the case with Barbara when she had that first colonoscopy. I decided to repeat Barbara's colonoscopy because it had been seven years since her last one and her symptoms were quite severe. And even though they sounded like diverticulosis, I just wanted to make sure there was nothing else going on. When I took a look at her colon the second time around, the diverticulosis was much more extensive than on her previous exam. Instead of the little dimples that the gastroenterologist had described seven years ago who did the first colonoscopy, I was now seeing large crater-like potholes, and it, it made the lower half of her colon look like Swiss cheese. They were that big. Barbara's mother, her aunt, and her paternal grandfather all had diverticulosis. But diverticulosis is not genetic. It's just really common in more developed countries because of our diet. And people from the same family tend to have the same diet, so they have the same risk factors for developing it. Barbara grew up in the Midwest eating the same meat and potatoes diet that the rest of her family ate. She told me that greens were basically garnish to put around the roast beef and that a salad usually involved jello. I'm not slamming the Midwestern diet. This is just what Barbara told me she grew up eating. Diverticulosis is a direct result of a diet that is too low in fiber and too high in animal products and ultra-processed foods. When your colon has to contract more vigorously to expel that small, hard stool that is characteristic of a low-fiber diet, it causes a lot of pressure in the wall of your colon. And that pressure leads to small bulges or dimples, which eventually become diverticulosis, frequently referred to as pouches, pockets, or potholes. I am seeing more and more patients in their 20s and 30s with diverticulosis. Now, this is a disease that's supposed to strike in your 60s and 70s. And the explanation for why we're seeing it in young people is on our plate. In sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world where people eat lots of high-fiber root vegetables and legumes and whole grains and not a lot of animal products or ultra-processed foods, they have big bulky stools that drop effortlessly from their rectum. And they also have something else. Very low rates of diverticulosis. In fact, in societies who eat like that, diverticulosis is pretty much non-existent. Those high fiber bowel movements don't require vigorous contractions of your colon. They don't leave any messy residue requiring reams of toilet paper. And they don't cause leakage because your colon is emptying completely. They create what I like to refer to as the clean wipe. One or two swipes and you're done. In the U.S., the recommendation is 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. But if you are eating anything resembling the standard American diet, you are only getting about 10 grams of fiber. And you are probably having schmary stools and a very messy cleanup, not a clean wipe. You are also at risk for problems like diverticulosis and colon cancer, also associated with a low-fiber diet. Diverticulosis can occur anywhere along the length of your colon but it's most common in the sigmoid colon. That's a lower part of your colon that works the hardest to push stool into your rectum. It's a part of the colon directly above the rectum. And that pushing, when the stool is hard and small, like when we see when you are not eating enough fiber, causes your sigmoid colon to become thickened and to develop those diverticular potholes. Stool can get stuck in those potholes, and it can get stuck in there for days or even weeks at a time. 
the combination of potholes filled with stool and a narrow, thickened sigmoid colon will make you feel really full, bloated, and uncomfortable. Your sigmoid colon is located in the lower left part of your abdomen, but it can sometimes extend across the midline, and it lies just above the pelvic bone. And that is where most people have discomfort, in the lower left quadrant or in the mid area above the pelvic bone. And it's not uncommon for people to mistakenly think that it's a problem with their bladder. So now your thick sigmoid colon full of stool is pressing down on your rectum, and it's creating this strong sensation that you have to have a bowel movement. But there's a problem. There isn't actually enough stool in your rectum to trigger contraction of the muscles necessary for a bowel movement to happen. And if you want to hear all the details about how that happens, check out episode two of the Gutless podcast, Shy Bowel, one of my favorites. Okay, so you are now in and out of the bathroom because you have all this pressure from your sigmoid colon and it feels like you have to go, but the stool is actually stuck in those potholes in your sigmoid colon instead of being down in the rectum. Finally, some of those potholes begin to empty and you start to have a little action, but it takes multiple trips because the potholes don't all empty at once. So you end up squeezing out a couple pellets or some toothpaste-like ribbons of stool that are very unsatisfactory. And you end up with multiple small bowel movements but you still feel constipated. And that is one of the most annoying symptoms of diverticulosis and also the most characteristic. People will say, I'm going to the bathroom six, seven, eight times a day, but I'm constipated. Hallmark symptom. Can diverticulosis turn into a more serious problem? Yes. Two possible complications include diverticulitis. Itis means inflammation where the potholes become inflamed or even infected, and also bleeding is another complication. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, things that contain ibuprofen, can increase the risk of both bleeding and diverticulitis. When we come back, how do you treat diverticulosis and get rid of those incredibly frustrating symptoms? Now, when it comes to treatment, I want to be clear about something. If you have complications of diverticulosis, like an acute attack of diverticulitis with an inflamed or infected segment of bowel, then bowel rest with a liquid diet and no fiber is often the best course of action until things improve. You may even need antibiotics if you have a fever or a lot of abdominal tenderness, and on very rare occasions, You may need surgery to remove part of your colon if you develop a serious complication like an abscess. But I want you to remember that complications like diverticulitis and bleeding are the exception, not the norm. Most people with diverticulosis may have symptoms of the diverticulosis, but they will never experience complications like diverticulitis or bleeding. And for more information on how to manage diverticular disease in general, including acute attacks, check out the Gutless Guide to Diverticulosis, which you can find at gutless.com under Gut Guides. If you are like most people with diverticulosis and you have symptoms but no complications, dietary change can make a huge difference. When Barbara and I sat down to formulate a plan for her symptoms, One of the things I asked her to do was to aim for more than 30 grams of fiber every day. But there was one sort of rule to that. I asked her not to count any of the grams of fiber that she was consuming from cereal, from pasta, from baked goods, or from bread. Not all fiber is created equal when it comes to bowel movements. Unprocessed, naturally occurring fiber in foods like fruits, vegetables, squash, yams, nuts, seeds, beans, provide the type of fiber that has way more bang for the buck in your bowel movements than what you would get from processed sources like breakfast cereals, whole wheat bread, fiber bars, chips, and baked goods, no matter what the nutritional label on the package says. That's just a reality. Even though Barbara was eating a reasonable amount of fruits and vegetables, a lot of it was tropical fruit like pineapple and bananas and salad with iceberg lettuce. Now, these foods have valuable nutrients, but they don't have that much fiber. 
So I recommended that she eat more apples and pears and berries. And I also suggested that she put some chickpeas and some cut up broccoli into her salads and use romaine lettuce or kale instead of iceberg. But Barbara still needed some help getting to 30 grams of fiber a day. So I started her on a tablespoon of ground psyllium husk fiber in the morning. And psyllium husk can be fantastically helpful with diverticulosis. It can work as a broom to sort of sweep out those potholes. But I warned Barbara that things could get worse before they got better, and they did. The first two weeks, as her body was adjusting to the additional fiber and the psyllium, she was even more bloated and more constipated than she had originally been, and she was literally on the verge of firing me as her gastroenterologist. But then something happened. Her bowel movements started to bulk up and get bigger, much bigger, fill the toilet bowl bigger, clog the toilet bowl bigger on one occasion. And they also started to get less frequent. Ten trips to the bathroom became five, and then five settled into about three. So the bowel movements were now getting consolidated because of the increased fiber. Even though Barbara still had a feeling of fullness from her thickened sigmoid colon that really wasn't going to go away, she was much less bloated, and she wasn't spending all day in the bathroom, and she was having three bowel movements instead of ten. So she was pretty happy with the results. I want to leave you with three takeaways about diverticulosis. Number one. If your symptoms sound like diverticulosis, I want you to find out if you really have it because there are other things in the colon that can mimic some of these signs and symptoms. You can diagnose diverticulosis with a colonoscopy or a CAT scan and be sure to ask if it showed any signs of diverticulosis, including thickening in the sigmoid colon or dimpling, which can be early signs. And of course, great idea to get the report yourself and take a look at it. Number two. If you have symptoms from diverticulosis, like a feeling of incomplete emptying or you're having multiple bowel movements, I want you to try eating a high-fiber diet, aiming for at least 30 grams of fiber from unprocessed sources like fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. And remember, to get all that fiber down to your colon to unclog those potholes, you need to drink a lot of water at least half your body weight in ounces of water. So if you weigh 200 pounds, that's 100 ounces of water minimum. And number three, if that is still not working, consider adding a tablespoon of psyllium husk in the morning. You want to do it in the morning so it has all day to get down to your colon. You want to mix it with at least eight ounces of liquid, ideally water. You could put in a splash of something if it doesn't taste good. But you want to follow it by an additional eight ounce glass of water sort of chaser glass. And remember that you may feel full and maybe even a little more bloated the first few days, but after a week or two, your body should be used to the increased fiber and you should start seeing improvements in your bowel habits. So that's it for this week's edition of the Gut Bliss Podcast on potholes in your colon. For more information on how to manage diverticulosis, including acute attacks, check out the Gut Bliss Guide to Diverticulosis. You can find it at gutbliss.com under Gut Guides. Go to gutbliss.com for my free seven-day microbiome reboot course. If you like what you're hearing, drop a review and hit that subscribe button. And remember, dirt, sweat, vegetables, the best prescription for a healthy gut. The information presented in this show is not meant to be medical advice. Consult your doctor before making any decisions about your health. The patients discussed are real people, but names and identifying features have been changed to protect their privacy.